Hi, everybody. Welcome to the vector rendering panel. Uh, this is, I think, the last panel of the day, so after this will be the beer drinking panel. Uh, uh, I'm up here with uh, four uh, experts in vector rendering. Uh, I've got Matt Blair from MapZen working on the Tangram project, uh, Constantine, <laughs> Constantine Kafer from Mapbox, who's working on the WebGL and OpenGL rendering process there, Steve Gifford on the far side there, uh, working on the Whirly Globe and Maply rendering library, <laughs> and Hannes Janacek uh, of OpenScienceMap.org. And my name is Michael Magursky. Uh, I used to do maps. Now I do panels. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about a number of different topics that are related to vectors and vector rendering and things. Uh, that includes server, client-side processing, vector data, tiles, rendering technologies, kind of all the stuff that has to do with getting vectors out of a database and onto a screen in a pocket or on a desktop. Um, I'm going to do a round of quick introductions for everybody. I'll basically just uh, quickly describe each person's work. I'm going to ask them to do a little bit more introduction about themselves with a few pictures that we have up on the big screen. Um, and then I've asked each panelist to define vector rendering because it seems like a useful thing to define since it has so many meetings. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Matt Blair. Matt Blair works on the Tangram project at MapZen. MapZen is a company here in New York with offices in San Francisco and a few folks scattered around the globe. Uh, Tangram is a new uh, WebGL and uh, OpenGL rendering library that MapZen is working on in order to produce you know, beautiful, interactive, sometimes three-dimensional, and often very cool-looking renderings of OpenStreetMap. Uh, Matt, would you like to tell us a little bit more about some of the screenshots here? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, so yeah, as Mike said, Tangram is uh, based on OpenGL in both the uh, in the form of WebGL on browsers and OpenGL ES in mobile devices. And what you're looking at now is just a pretty conventional view of 3D buildings in New York. This is uh, Tangram ES. We call it the the mobile device centered version. And um, are there more shots or? So what you're looking at here is um, the WebGL version. They're very similar in architecture and support the same style sheets, but uh, this is a more artistically oriented map. As you can see, it's um, geared towards really, really allowing you to be expressive in your map design more than, um, more than anything we've seen before, as far as I can tell. And uh, this is sort of what Vector, vector rendering means to me is, I would say it's freedom. Um, vector rendering is about getting, it's about getting uh, your data in a form that you can transform yourself in any way you can imagine. Um, I think there's one more shot, is there? Oh. Oh. So I think that's for Hannes actually. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. It's fine. <laughs> Including things like this. Um, this is visualizing OpenStreetMap data in uh, ways that you normally would not think about, but are entirely possible when you get your data in vectors. So that's what I like about vector rendering. Oops. Hey, I'm Konstantin. Um, I work on Mapbox GL, and Mapbox GL is a mobile SDK that you can embed in your iOS application, your Android application to render beautiful, awesome maps. Um, it's based on the Mapbox vector tiles, which are based on OpenStreetMap. Um, I guess you can. And what you can do with Mapbox GL as well is you can create completely custom styles. You can uh, base your work either on one of the predefined styles and uh, improve them, or you can create a new style from scratch. And creating a style means that you can define anything, including the font. You can use your custom fonts to render maps. Uh, you can use any sort of colors. You can add any of the data that you want. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a mobile analytics dashboard. When you add Mapbox GL to your iOS app or to your Android app, you can view these analytics and see where people are using, how people are interacting with your map. You can get lots of statistics like uh, 
operating system screen sizes where people are looking at, uh, which just helps you to understand the users of your app a lot better. And uh, finally, we have this uh, uh, shot that shows you how you can smoothly animate Mapbox shell from one place to another. It's, uh, uh, it has seamless zooming, obviously, so you can uh, show any zoom level you want. You don't have any predefined zoom levels. You can rotate the map as well, um, and you see the labels popping in uh, when you get closer. And what does vector rendering mean for you? Vector rendering for me means uh, rendering the data directly on the device, uh, and it allows you to change the view in response to the actions of the user. So you don't have to go back to the server to render a new image, but rather you can adapt the view. You can add your own data locally without having to submit it to the server and you can add and remove it. You can change the style instantly without having to re-render uh, the map on the server. So it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of the design and the uh, interaction with the map. Thank you. Steve, help me. Okay. Um, yeah, so my toolkit is a, a little different in that it's, it's um, not tied to any specific data format. It, it does a lot of different ones. Um, so yeah, go on to the next slide. So it, it's known for doing raster and vector data. So this first slide is from an app called Dark Sky. It's a very popular weather app on uh, iOS devices. Now on to the next one. And then this example is National Geographic World Atlas. And this is kind of an interesting one because it uses a hybrid of image and vector data together to get uh, kind of those fancy backgrounds but very sharp uh, symbols and text and things like that. But it's just standard Mapbox data format, even if the data contained within that is not OpenStreetMap. And then the last one, and this one's an OpenStreetMap example. Again, it's vector data, um, but in this case, it's being rendered on device, um, and the routing is being done on device. In this case, that's my toolkit interfacing to another toolkit, which is doing the, the routing information and such. But so two of those examples are, are using vectors in, in kind of interesting ways. And in terms of what vector rendering means to me, to me it means uh, sort of half digested data. Like these, uh, these renders, uh, whether they be based on JavaScript or their native renders for mobile devices, they're, they can't process like an entire planet file from OpenStreetMap. Like they would just choke on that. So you gotta chop it up into little bits for them and then hand it to them in a way that they can process that. So it's not like you're displaying image tiles where all the selections have been made. You're kind of pre-digesting it a little bit and then handing it to that in that form and they can do interesting things with that. So you can do not quite as much as you could if you got the full planet file, but you can do way more than you could if you just got image tiles. Um, uh, our project is uh, slightly different. It uh, started as a, a university project uh, um, to do studies in a cognitive science group uh, for user interaction uh, with maps. And for this, we required um, uh, continuous zooming and fast rendering. And at, at that time, it was just not available. If these options that were all mentioned were available, we probably would have chosen and one of these. Um, so um, our renderer is um, an OpenGL uh, vector tile renderer primarily for Android. Um, and uh, we started with uh, MapsForge uh, uh, client-side uh, bitmap tile rendering on Android, which is quite popular. Uh, which um, does already styling of OpenStreetMap um, tags and um, pre-processed geometries. And um, then the part that we developed was a tile server, which sends um, basically um, pre-computed uh, uh, and simplified OpenStreetMap geometries to the client. Um, Yes, and here you can see 
uh, our um, map application uh, demo showing um, the university building of Bremen, um, where we developed this. And um, yeah, it, it got, uh, we did some research um, with it, implemented a few uh, papers, uh, and um, some students in the project wrote their master thesis um, based on this, or in this field. And, uh, but it also become, became um, uh, popular or for people who really wanted to make map applications. So for example, uh, map then and their map prototype chose our renderer and um, yeah, sm many small companies asked for help how to integrate it. So this was quite amazing how this project evolved in this regards. Yeah. And how would you define vector rendering for yourself? Uh, so the client side vector rendering, um, yeah, it's the option to style the map um, um, interactively and um, choose which features you want to show, highlight, um, so get more information about this um, particular feature instead of making the round trip to the server. And of course, the smooth interaction of uh, scaling rotation is not possible with uh, pre-computed bitmap tiles on the server or where the vector rendering is done on the server. Cool. Thank you. So one of the themes that I've been hearing in kind of everybody's description of what vector rendering is for them is that there's this theme of you know moving things to the client. Uh, and I think, Matt, you use the term freedom in your description. I think it's pretty interesting because I'm hearing a little bit of that in Steve's description as well, this kind of developer choice. Matt, can you talk a bit more about that, that freedom and that developer choice? Yeah, I mean, I gave a pretty high level description, I would say, of, of what that meant. Um, and I mean, the nuts and bolts of it is that uh, in this context, when we talk about vector rendering, it's um, that what you get from a service from a from a server that's not you know something you own, uh, what you get on your device is not uh, it's not a pre-drawn map. It's not instructions on how to draw a map. It's just things that you can draw and how you draw it is up to you. And that's the difference between uh, a client-side vector renderer and um, what's been done before in, in terms of what we call raster renderers or raster tiles and uh, bitmaps, you might call it. Um, so to me, it's, uh, it's a way of uh, democratizing style. It's a lot easier to design something on the client side and get immediate feedback and um, experiment that way. And that's one of the cooler things that I see about it. Constantine, it seems like for you, performance and, and rendering speed are, are very important. I know from reading a lot of your Mapbox uh, blog posts over the years that you have focused on things like you know correct line rendering and uh, glyph sets and text rendering and just general kind of like high performance situations. That seems to be something that's really important on mobile as well. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the implications for performance and speed that you've seen from from vector rendering? Um, so. Basically, the, the need for performance arises because nobody wants to interact with a map that is uh, slow and that is stuttering. So uh, the need for speed is actually mostly driven by, by the users. And um, the difficult part is that just using raster images on the client is very, very fast because mobile devices are super good at just displaying textures. But the difficult part is when you try to render a map dynamically for every frame. So you have to render everything from scratch, basically, for every frame. Because when you rotate the map, you cannot reuse any of the previous frame uh, frames images, because the rotation is just different. So when uh, we started working on Mapbox GL, we 
one of our main priorities was to have a very high visual quality that is comparable to software-based rendering, like rendering with Mapnik. So we did a lot of research into ways for of uh, rendering lines that look as good as possible. And that need arises from the fact that OpenGL is not focused on rendering high visual quality images. For example, OpenGL allows you to draw lines, but these lines are very, very bare bones. They're basically just one line connected to another line, but you don't have any features in OpenGL that allow you to draw line joints, like round line joints when the like line makes a turn. And the anti-aliasing is also very, very device and implementation dependent, so you can't really use all of that feature. So basically what you have to do for uh, rendering uh, lines in OpenGL is just convert them to triangles, to polygons, and then use a shader that uh, paints the pixels in those polygons in the correct way. Um, same thing for text rendering. There's no facility for rendering text in OpenGL at all. Um, so you have to create everything from scratch. You have to like load your own glyphs, uh, place them in the correct position, and make sure they uh, they, they look nice uh, by using, uh, we use a technology called signed distance fields, uh, which basically just looks up the distance to the uh, font outline from a texture. Um, because rendering uh, actual vector textures, uh, actual vex, uh, vectors from fonts doesn't really work in OpenGL uh, because it only supports strong triangles and not any curved, uh, uh, curved objects. Uh, these are just uh, two of the examples that, that we focused on when uh, making a Mapbox shell. And again, the reason why we focus on that is because we wanted to achieve a very high visual quality uh, to uh, just get nice looking maps. Steve, I think your project is one of, uh, one of the ones that kind of most takes advantage of the full kind of interactivity and like the circularity of the earth and you, you really do the kind of zoomed out view in contrast to a lot of the other work that I've seen focusing on OpenStreetMap. Um, I also know from your own personal history that you've been doing this stuff for many, many years and have a deep background in kind of computer graphics and, and rendering technologies. It seems like from what Constantine was saying that uh, you kind of have to be up on the academia and up on the papers and up on the techniques in order to take full advantage of this stuff. Can you talk a little bit about kind of your own journey working through all this stuff and kind of how you got to where you are uh, with an eye towards sort of, you know, computer graphics as a technique as compared to just blitting pixels on a screen? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I've been doing OpenGL back before it was OpenGL. So, um, you know, I followed it through the years. And it, it's actually got a lot simpler on mobile devices because OpenGL had gotten very bloated and complicated uh, for a while, very functional. And then they chopped most of that out for the uh, embedded systems version. So you could kind of start with a clean slate. And that can be very confusing, um, but at least it's simpler than it used to be. But um, really, you know, it's funny. I, I used to think rendering was, was really the main issue, like actually getting everything set up for OpenGL. And, and feeding it through the pipeline on these devices. But as I've, uh, I've been working on the toolkit now for more than four years, and as customers come to me with different requirements, I'm finding that it's really the data fetching and the kind of the data management that's the hard part. So for example, if you're drawing vector tiles, it's really getting them all together in a coherent fashion, uh, getting the, the lines, for example, to look right, uh, building up the, the texture atlases for the, the font glyphs and, and stuff like that that tends to dominate more than the actual rendering, just kind of getting all the data together. And, you know, I, I have to handle more of that on the, um, on the toolkit side than maybe, you know, Mapbox or Mapsan or anybody else does because the data is often coming to me in a less uh, predefined way. You know, it's really nice to have, like, the Mapbox sector tiles come down the pipe because they're well-defined and you can anticipate what you're going to get, reuse resources. It's really nice. You get something less... Um, less well-defined, and you kind of have to put it all together yourself. So you build up all these data structures to doing that, for doing that. And if, if they have uh, data that's changing, like they want to display uh, like 5,000 plane positions moving in real time, then you kind of have to structure that in different ways. So I, I guess that's what I found is it's really the data organization that's the tricky part. Um, 
which you know you can do on the server side makes it a little bit easier but when you have to do more of it on the client side it gets tricky it gets very very tricky so you've just mentioned data and data formats and it seems like the way that data gets from a server to a client in order to do this client side vector rendering feels like a really important part of the pipeline um, we've seen a lot of different approaches to this stuff in the OpenStreetMap ecosystem for the past few years. Uh, you know, GeoJSON tiles, SVG tiles from different providers. I think CloudMade was making those about five or so years ago. Um, we're starting to see a lot of protobuffer-based kind of binary formats now. Um, Hannes, I think you actually developed a format using protobufs for Open Science Map that's different from some of the other ones. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, back then when we started, there was uh, and no uh, vector tile rendering for mobile devices, um, as far as I know. Um, and uh, yeah, we looked into the different we, we looked into the different approaches, um, and first wanted to start with uh, GeoJSON uh, vector tiles, and um, I found that the Kotec GS renderer did. Um, Mapnik style rendering in the canvas or for in the uh, HTML canvas, um, and they slightly modified the uh, GeoJSON format to pre-process the um, them into a Mercator projection and uh, scale it to a fixed quartile relative coordinate system. And we took this idea um, as it. Um, um, was beneficial to compress the data when you um, have um, a fixed um, diff and, um, f between the points you can, can um, yeah, you just encode the difference <laughs> between the points and um, uh, then um, I found the protocol uh, buffers format to have a good encoding for uh, small sign numbers, and so we picked protocol buffers, uh, as it also um, seemed uh, to, um, yeah, as it was uh, good for prototyping, it mm, gives you all the tools to um, quickly create the data um, and experiment with it, and if you need faster parsing, you can also write your uh, Quite a simple on parsers. And I can follow up on the data format part. Uh, I had something to contribute on my thoughts on the data format aspect of this rendering stuff. Um, so, one of the consequences of uh, getting vector data on your client side uh, as opposed to getting uh, an image or you know, something closer to an image, is that uh, this data is not particularly well organized for drawing. Um, the fact that it's not telling you how to draw something means that uh, you often uh, need to look at all of the data to figure out how to draw it. You can't just look at part of it and draw part of it. You can sometimes do that. Um, but if you contrast tile formats with something like um, the JPEG image format, for instance, um, uh, JPEGs are specifically suited for drawing. And so the data format is um, often such that you can incrementally draw aspects of the image. And you'll probably be familiar with this phenomenon from uh, like 90s, 56K internet. You'll get like a partially loaded image. And because the data is structured in such a way that it knows that you're going to be looking at this thing progressively, um, and that's actually useful, then you can do that with a JPEG. However, uh, vector tile data is often not organized in this way, but it might be a useful thing to think about um, if someone would come up with something that you could incrementally draw parts of a tile as it's coming in and see uh, maybe the most interesting parts of the map and then less necessary details can come in later. That would be a real boon to client-side rendering. So it seems like between kind of the cartographic intent and the transmission format and everything else, there's kind of a lot of concerns that you guys are raising that aren't really just kind of graphics concerns, but have to do with this whole data pipeline. I'm curious, I, do I actually have two minutes left? Okay, I'm getting the two minute marker. I was <laughs> hoping that you guys could kind of wind up by basically talking a little bit about what part you thought would be easy that turned out not to be easy. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Matt, and just move in this direction. 
text. <laughs> That's easy. Um, text rendering is really a big issue. Um, it's, as Constantine pointed out, um, rendering fonts the way that an operating system might where you can actually like render the entire vector image of each letter um, is just not at all practical in OpenGL. Um, you'd have to generate tons of triangles for each individual letter and you have hundreds or thousands of, th of these things on a given view on your device and uh, it's, yeah, it's not, all, not at all feasible with current technology. So, um, and this is further complicated by things like international, uh, or sorry, like Unicode uh, sets of characters that are often uh, I mean like Arabic characters, Hindi characters, Chinese characters. Um, these are even more difficult because they can be uh, contextually dependent. The, the glyphs that you need to draw depend on the glyphs that are next to each other. Uh, this is called text shaping and it's a huge, huge field. Um, so we've had a lot of, uh, <laughs> we've had a lot of fun getting text shaping to work correctly in Tangram and uh, we're still not all the way there. So that was harder than I expected. Uh, for us, all of what uh, Matt just said is exactly true. Um, in, a, in addition to that, uh, this, I guess the second hardest thing we've encountered is uh, uh, label placement, which is different from actual text uh, rendering. And uh, the reason for why text labeling is so complicated is because there's no right solution. There's literally um, an unlimited amount of ways how you can label a map. And really how you want to label a map depends on, depends on the context. So for some uh, reasons, uh, for some use cases, certain types of labels may be more important than other labels. For example, if you want to uh, catch a metro, the labels for the metro station may be a lot more important than the labels for uh, a coffee shop. Um, and I guess vector rendering on the mobile device helps us in that case because we can dynamically change uh, what's displayed on the map. Hannes, how about yourself? What's some hard stuff that you thought would be easy? I'm, I'm continuing with the label placement. Um, yeah, that's um, in itself, it's a hard part to get a good placement for and just for static maps. It's uh, an old research topic and um, to help cartographers to uh, lay out the labels in a way that the most important features are uh, shown. And um, yeah, with this continuous uh, zooming, um, it even gets ha harder because you want to have consistency um, between the frames, the labels. Uh, you don't, don't want to make the label placement on the data that is only available in the frame because then um, it depends on the, uh, it, or it can depend on the order um, which label is chosen and they start to flicker. You see it even in some commercial maps uh, still. Um, and to um, get uh, a really continuous zooming in where labels don't jump uh, around or are selected on a lower zoom level, then you zoom in and suddenly they disappear. Um, this is still a challenging, challenging um, aspect. Yeah, I've actually got a different one just because of the nature of my toolkit. Um, the thing that I spent the most time on that I never expected to is tile fetching. So if you've got a tile source, which is say coming from you know one of these standard guys, it's in spherical Mercator, it starts at level zero. Um, now imagine you're warping that onto a globe or you're running it through a different projection you have to figure out how big that is on the screen, how big its children are, and so on. And you have to do this on a mobile device in a, in a tiny fraction of a second because nobody really wants to wait for that. So that's, you know, and it gets more complicated in 3D versus 2D, you know, and, and uh, users kind of want to see something quickly, so you have to decide if you're going to fetch a lower level first before you go to the higher level. And it's just part of the system that I have revisited again and again and again. It's much more complicated than I thought it would be. Cool. Thank you. So I was actually expecting 45 minutes instead of half an hour. I was hoping for audience question time. Okay, great. Let's hear some audience question time. Uh, right here in the front. Um, uh, Yuri from Wikimedia. Um, 
there was some con conversations in the hallways about uh, interna international I-18N. Um, so the question is, um, with vector tiles, how do you see 900 languages or eight, eight, 800 languages that Wikipedia is kind of currently semi-supporting? And uh, where do we go from there? So the question was, how can vector rendering support the 900 languages of Wikipedia? Um, Constantine, I think you mentioned a couple of things about that. Uh, yeah, sure. So encoding all of these languages into vector tiles is uh, definitely possible. And when you look at the location names, most of the names for most of the languages are the same. So for example, look at uh, like a city name like Berlin. Uh, it's Berlin and almost all languages. There are some languages that have an O added to the end. There are some languages that like just use different scripts. Uh, but these are typically very, very low. So you can basically just add all of the, um, basically just encode the uh, main name like Berlin or like the native name like Berlin. And then you just co encode the differences for the various scripts that actually have, or the, the various languages that actually have different uh, names. and. In terms of file size, this typically is not very big. Typically for most uh, cities, um, you have a couple of names and then street names don't typically have local translations. When you look at the, the amount of street names that have more than two languages in OpenStreetMap, that number is very low. Cool, there was another question. Oh, here, Clifford. <laughs> Was uh, vector tiles? How stable are they, and um, what's keeping OSM from using them? So the question was, how stable are vector tiles, and being OSM from using them? Uh, Matt, do you want to take that, <laughs> or do any of you want to take that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, what, what kind of stability? What kind of st what kind of stability is the question? I think I'm not seeing OSM actually. Um, brush out and do them. So I keep thinking maybe there's something unstable about them. Maybe that there's some, it's, it's not a mature um, technology. Mm -hmm. So the, the question, the follow-on question was sort of why isn't OSM using them? Is there some sort of maturity issue there? I guess there's a bigger question around that, which is like why now and why not yet at the same time? Um, so our vector tile service is um, as a, as university project and so it uh, has an experimental nature but there are now um, company backed vector tile services and it's um, yeah the format that was developed by Mapbox is now supported by many uh, renderers so I guess it's um, um, yeah they map then as uh, also uh, vector tile services providing these formats and you can use it in your applications already and so Matt you guys are fairly new to this I'm curious since you're developing this you know a little bit um, more recently you probably have a little bit further view of all the stuff that's been tried and maybe where it's gone or where it hasn't gone maybe you could talk about the current state of vector data formats that might be useful to OpenStreetMap as an organization The, uh, the format issue is, I guess you could say, uh, not yet totally mature. Um, there are a few emerging formats that are very, very commonly used and uh, widely accepted as being a pretty good format. Um, however, there are probably at least four formats that are um, substantially popular and uh, that's you know maybe a big number for, for people who are looking at it in terms of like a uh, a unified platform. Uh, so as far as I know, maps and services are uh, pretty, uh, we're pretty open in terms of the formats that we choose to support. We support uh, top adjacent tiles, uh, map box tiles, uh, uh, geojson tiles, and uh, open science map tiles. And um, yeah, we're open to future formats as well, but it's, um, that's sort of, in a way, more of a, 
I don't know, I see it as more of a server issue in that the server has to, um, you know, manage these data sets and um, the client can adapt to uh, a lot of things. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my take on it. <laughs> A uh, question right there, Andy. It's not a question, it's an answer <laughs> for the previous question. The, the previous question was um, why isn't OpenStreetMap doing it or why aren't they doing it yet? And the answer is 80% is manpower. We, we just don't have spare manpower to do these kind of things, so it happens slower than you would otherwise expect. And the other 20% is the server-side software for generating um, vector tiles isn't mature. There's still a lot of different options. There's not an obvious upgrade path from our current use of mod tile and render D. Um, there's no version of mod tile and render D that does vector tiles. So to change the entire software stack is again a problem that we need to solve. So I would say 80% manpower, 20% the server side software. All the rendering and things like that, that's all cool. That, that'll work when it needs to work. Thank you. <laughs> Other question? Uh, yes, right here. The other thing is that we've been waiting for MapNIC 3, basically. Because you need MapNIC 3 to do vector tiles. So hopefully next week. <laughs> so MapNIC 3, possible answer. I think uh, you had something to add as well, Honest. Um, yeah, for, uh, for the um, OSM stack, if they use uh, Tyrex um, for the t t render queue management, I'm not sure. We use RenderD, not Tyrex. Oh, okay, because for our infrastructure, we use the Tyrex, and uh, for this, um, we wrote an extension that one can use the tiles dash layers um, together with Tyrex uh, to get um, to update the tiles, and this works quite well. Um, so, if one, someone wants to experiment with this, <laughs> it's on the Open Science Map GitHub account. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, maybe one thing that's also stopping um, or is really hard is the generalization of the data for the lower zoom levels. And um, to do this in a cartographic acceptable way is quite hard. So it's just simplifying geometries. Um, um, uh, yeah, can can destroy the topology or make it hard to read. Um, so this should be improved to make really um, good maps. Vector maps. Thank you. There was a question back here with a hat. Uh, hi, my name is Derek uh, from Juicy Trails. And um, I was just wondering your opinion about how the uh, offline download capabilities of vector maps compares to raster maps. So the question was about the offline uh, download capabilities of raster versus vector. Who's interested in answering this one? Oh, here we go. Yeah, we actually, we did just that with um, National Geographic World Atlas. And it was really nice because we got, so it's a hybrid image vector map but it's much smaller than the equivalent image map would be. So the, the download time went down to just a few minutes. So I'm, I'm a big fan of shoving everything into a, a, a single SQLite database with one blob per tile and just shoving that on a device. It's really a, an improvement in most cases. Uh, in terms of uh, file sizes for vector tiles, uh, they, they really heavily depend on the amount of simplification and generalization you apply. Um, we found at Mapbox that most of the vector tiles are similar to uh, the uh, image tiles in terms of file size. However, there's one important thing to consider and uh, that's to do with the amount of zoom levels that you support. With vector tiles, we only go down to zoom level 14 or 15, but to show street level uh, raster tiles, you'd have to store the raster tiles up to zoom level 18 or 19 on the device, 
which obviously takes up a lot more space. So in general, storing vector tiles on the device takes up way less space. And it has the added advantage of being able to change the design so you don't have to store separate uh, raster tiles for every style that you want to support in your app. More questions? Yes, right here. Uh, yes, a little bit more comments on your font approach, actually, is uh, generally the end users are not going to care as much about a, a pretty little drawn polygon. They care about the readability of the map itself. That always comes from text and fonts. Uh, just a word of advice, I spent about six months of my life getting vectorizations of fonts working correctly. It is possible uh, to do on that, but you have to actually go to the operating system and have them handle those kerning pairs and the specialized characters and stuff for you. Because if you don't do that, there's no way that vectors are going to be usable at a global scale without handle first handling the font issues. So I don't want to undersimplify how difficult that is. So I don't think vectors are really ready until that's been solved. So an interesting comment there about needing to go down to the operating system level for, for getting the kind of font and type rendering right. Something that kind of struck me, I think, um, Constantine, you were talking about maybe Arabic characters. It seems like there's a lot of work that's already happened at the OS level to sort of solve that to some degree. Is there a way that you guys are kind of bringing up that lower level stuff without re-implementing it? It seems like both of you actually have a response to this. Uh, so, so what you're talking about is, uh, and what Matt also mentioned, is uh, uh, text shaping and contextual replacements. Um, and there are a couple of libraries that already exist, most importantly Harfbus, uh, which is, I guess, mostly developed by Google. And uh, Harfbus implements all of the text shaping. So there's no need to develop all of that. However, to use Harfbus, uh, you need to access the actual uh, font files. And uh, these font files are typically very large because they contain glyphs for many, many thousand uh, code points. So uh, to give you an example, uh, Arial Unicode uh, is about uh, 20 megabytes. The uh, Google Notos, uh, Google's Noto fonts, which cover almost all of Unicode, are in a similar size range. So shipping that amount of data with your app may not be a good idea. So in many cases, going to the uh, actual operating system um, to obtain the, uh, or to, to make Harfbus use the shaping information from the fonts that are on the device um, is a good idea. Uh, for Mapbox GL, we aren't doing that yet. Uh, we are working on that. Yeah, I was going to mention HarfBuzz. Um, we've absolutely learned that it's not a problem that we want to resolve. Um, HarfBuzz is the solution for uh, text shaping that's used in uh, Chrome, among uh, probably many other cases. And uh, because of that, it's a very reliable solution. It's battle-hardened. And um, yeah, there's no need for us to, to reinvent all of that. Um, so that takes care of a lot of uh, layout issues, kerning, and uh, text shaping. And as far as like the uh, actual readability quality. Um, there's a technique that was first established in video games actually called uh, assigned distance field rendering, um, which lets you get um, perfectly visually crisp um, outlines on glyphs uh, at a wide range of scales. And we're applying that in our uh, renderer as well as using Harfbuzz for the layout. No. Um, 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 I actually wrote about label placement for vector tile maps in my thesis, and a large part of which I haven't written because it would have been too technical and low level was to implement such a, a font rendering with a free type um, for reading the fonts, half bus, and ICU for script recognition. Uh, so that you know wh wh which part of the text are left to right and right to left, and um, then sorting this all in the right order. Um, and um, yeah, for this I took uh, parts from different open source projects and put it in a library which can, uh, which is tailored to the specific task of um, drawing te uh, text with OpenGL, getting. Uh, um, 
and updating the paths for curved uh, labels with each frame. If you can show the screenshot, it should actually, yeah, there, you see it. So um, this is created uh, in each frame. When one zooms in, the label moves smoothly around the corners. So um, I'm going to release it soon, just need to clean it up. So uh, actually, I take a different approach than uh, most of these guys. I just use the OS. Um, the uh, the font, the glyph rendering and layout on iOS and, and Android is pretty good. Uh, and since those are the the systems I target, I just use what they say. And then I use a dynamic um, texture atlas to stick the glyphs in. So I just render them at double the size and then get rid of them when I'm done. So that that tends to solve uh, those problems. And since I don't have access to the server side, well, yeah. The complete labels. Not um, labels. Well, each letter, if you move them. Yeah, so, well, I mean, uh, so you use the glyph. The question was, how do you do curved labels? And you'd have to lay those out. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's a much harder problem. If you're doing just kind of simple labels, then you can ask the, the um, layout engine on iOS, for example, to do it for you and then reuse the glyphs, which is fast, pretty fast. That turned into a really big answer. I feel like there's one hand over here, and that'll probably be our last one. Like, what's the difference? Oh, yeah, sorry, very quick, uh, briefly, in terms of like rendering, the actual rendering, what languages would suffer if you uh, use geo rendering fund, uh, funds versus the existing infrastructure? Okay. What's, what's the current? Let's get back to that in just a second. I just want to finish up with this question here. Thank you. Um, I'm curious what kind of problems and solutions you've encountered to do with tiles, tile boundaries, um, label, label placement and consistency, and 3D buildings come to mind, but maybe there are other things. The biggest question for last <laughs> <laughs> is about tile boundaries and buildings and labels. <laughs> um, I don't know, Matt, do you want to take this one? I saw a cool 3D print of a neat tile boundary thing at your office yesterday. Yeah, so keeping map data in tiles is really useful. Um, it also causes a lot of problems. Uh, it's one of the things that um, we're really trying to be general about in uh, Tangram is um, getting arbitrary views into the map space, so looking um, looking at angles across the world, looking, you know, like up at the horizon and beyond. And um, this is really not what tiles were built for. Um, it's generally intended to be like you fetch a rectangle of space and that's it. Um, however, if you're looking at um, some tilted view into the world, um, you're actually looking at um, what projects down to a trapezoid and you have to figure out how to map that back onto this tile set. And not only that, but um, if you're looking at a large angle, you have a lot of area covered by the far end of your trapezoid that's uh, covering a lot of tiles and very, very little screen space. So um, we put a lot of work into figuring out how to um, figure out what size tile is appropriate to fetch based on where you're looking in the world. Um, it's very easy when you're looking top down and figuring out how to <laughs> Uh, sort of wrangle the tile hierarchy to your needs um, at an arbitrary view is a big problem, and there's no easy answer there. <laughs> so we're a little bit over time here, so I guess let's move this end bit to the beer panel, which is shortly after this one. Um, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you, Hannes, and thank you, Steve. Uh, in conclusion, vector rendering is a land of contrasts. Thank you, everyone.